It is known simply as the helmet. It started as a freshman football helmet that was kept as a memento, and then it spent the next five decades close to its keeper. Never in a closet, never in storage, it was close by, serving as a reminder to a great time period for a new school and a group of young men fortunate enough to be part of the first team to ever wear this helmet. After a long time of serving its keeper well, the helmet began an epic journey. It would travel the country to visit old teammates, even stopping in Canada, preparing for a special reunion. It had been 50 years since the young men of the Morris Knowles High School football team went undefeated in the school's first varsity football season. And, half a century later, on the campus of that very same Rockaway, New Jersey school, those teammates and their families reunited not only to relive those glory days, but also to deliver the helmet back to the school that provided these men with such great memories and experiences as they built the foundations for their adult lives. As an artifact from that very first season, this helmet is a prized keepsake for any Morris Knowles historian. However, it's the story of its journey that elevates the helmet to its legendary status. It is not adorned with nicks and scratches and color swatches from opposing teams. Rather, this helmet is inscribed with the names of the players and coaches from that undefeated 1965 championship team. Jim Stern Suve, a junior on that team and possessor of the helmet all these years, knew the 50th anniversary was approaching and he wanted to do something special for this historic event. Thus, he decided to send the helmet to his teammates around the country so they could sign it with an end goal of gathering for a reunion and giving the helmet back to the school. Suve's first call was to longtime friend and teammate, Greg Francis. Jim Suve called me and uh, told me I had this helmet, came up with this idea. I just called up Greg and said, hey, what about this? Greg said, mm, okay, let's try and pull it off. And with that first phone call, a plan was formed and the legend began. He signed the helmet, took his picture, sent it to me, showed me the format. I went out and got the box, and made the, uh, the step-by-step instructions on how to do this and then who to send it to next. Off the helmet went, from player to player, as each person put his name on it, personalized the sign, and took a photo with the helmet and placard. The helmet was then sent to the next person, and in cases where the player or coach had passed away, a family member took the honor of signing the individual's name and taking a picture in his place. By the time the 50th anniversary rolled around, they wanted the helmet signed by everyone so they could host a reunion and bring the helmet back to the school. Suve and Francis gained a lot of momentum early, but finding everyone was difficult, as Suve was in Arizona and Francis in California, while the rest of those teammates and coaches were scattered across the country. However, as is the case with so many special occasions, a magical moment occurred when local resident and fellow Morris Knowles alumnus Art Baggett joined the effort. Art Baggett, he's this young man that was probably in seventh or eighth grade when we were seniors. He just loved this team. When we told him about this helmet thing, he found guys that I couldn't find. So with the help of this super fan, the helmet continued its pilgrimage. But if you knew more about this team, you would understand why a fan would want to volunteer to join such a cause. The 1965 Morris Knowles football team was a tremendous group, one that could be described as special. Special in so many ways. The family ship, the camaraderie, the players, the coaches. It was just a group that you can never forget. And how could one forget this team? They were good, they were athletic, and they were tough. The 65 team it was a fantastic collection of athletes. This group was a great team. This was a lot of good athletes that turned into a great team. These guys were big, strong, tough guys, and they were all good. They played hard, physical football. How hard? Suve remembers vividly. First day in scrimmage, I went through the line, and I got hit so hard, I, I thought I was in a car accident. I couldn't breathe. They called the next play the same play, and the same thing happened. The team had a suffocating defense, one that punished their opponents. And they went on to beat everyone on their schedule in the 1965 season, 
the first varsity season at the new Morris Knowles High School. In going 9-0, they outscored their opponents 224-40 for an average margin of victory of 24-4. They recorded four shutouts and allowed one touchdown in each of four other games. Only West Morris scored more than one touchdown on these guys, and they scored just two. This defense was dominant. Quite frankly, it was easy because our defense never let anybody score. So all we had to do was score a couple points and we won. So we were a tremendous defensive team. We never lost. When you never lose, it's awful good. Every game was pretty amazing. This was indeed an amazing group who started their high school careers with success and only got better. As freshmen, they attended Morris Hills High School since Morris Knowles was not yet built. They suffered their first and only loss of their high school careers that year. Then they went undefeated in their sophomore season. However, change was in the wind as enrollment at Morris Hills was too much for the school to handle, so Morris Knowles was built. Knowles opened in the fall of 1964 and Morris Hills was split essentially in half. The incoming freshmen, rising sophomores, and rising juniors from Denville and parts of Rockaway Township were sent to the new school in Denville. As a first-year team of all underclassmen, they played a predominantly JV schedule along with a few games against smaller varsity teams. And despite having only half of their team from the previous Morris Hills years, again they went undefeated, setting them up for that special 1965 campaign where they won the conference in their first full varsity season, capping off a tremendous high school career. Our freshman year, we were 8-1, and we lost to Montclair. Sophomore year, we go undefeated, and we beat Montclair. Then we come over here to the Knowles, and we went 9-0. And, and our senior year was a full varsity schedule, we go 9-0. There's a group of guys in this group that lost one game in high school in four years. Pretty amazing. And they split that team up. Think about that. <laughs> yes, think about that. The 1965 All-Area First Team included eight of 12 players from either Morris Knowles or Morris Hills. The Eagles dominated their foes in 1965. It's crazy to think that they were only playing with half of their teammates from their freshman and sophomore years. But that team wasn't the only unit to be divided. The Morris Hills coaching staff was split as well. With the new high school opening in the district, some teachers and coaches moved over to the new building including football coach Frank Marino, who became the head coach of the new Morris Knowles football program. After several years as the Morris Hills football coach, Marino spent three years as the Knowles head coach before he went on to have an illustrious coaching career at Muhlenberg College. But prior to that Hall of Fame career at Muhlenberg, Marino had some work to do in establishing the new Morris Knowles football program. Coach and I came to Morris Knowles a brand new school, a brand new happening in 1964, and we're so lucky to be here for three years and the beginning of everything in this glorious, glorious place. Marino had quite a challenge in starting a new high school program, but he had a great cast of players with which to work, players whom he had recently coached as freshmen, and in the fall of 64 and again in 65, was able to build on those prior relationships and get the most out of his players. This whole thing was based on Marino and putting a bunch of guys together and convincing us that we were probably better than we were, but it was all about Marino coaching us up. Having those prior relationships helped Marino create strong bonds throughout this team. He always knit a family-like, committed group of kids. We have one goal, and if you do your part, we're all going to get to that end goal. His players bought in to his concept of the family, and it had tremendous results. Coach always talked about being a family. I always felt the responsibility. I didn't want to let these guys down. And if I fumbled or threw an interception, I just felt I was letting the family down. Marino's coaching style also relied heavily on developing the individual. Athletics were his tool. They were not an end for him. They were only a pathway to help kids find a way to grow up to be fantastic citizens and to contribute to whatever community they found themselves working in. Marino was very successful with his teams, both on and off the field. 
but it was his larger vision of developing these young boys into men that appears to have had the greatest impact on the players of that team. Fifty years later, it is what they still value the most. Mr. Marino's main wish was to help young men become men. And uh, all the fellows that I know that went through his programs, I think they uh, they solidified that fact. So he basically turned us to men and gave us a lot of confidence. You cheer them on, get it? That's the best part of this group, make sure they do their jobs. I mean, he had a lot to do with my life and getting to where I am today. Everything I have, he's responsible for. Marino's influence on Suve is rather profound. Suve was struggling early in high school. He was undersized and had suffered multiple broken bones when he started to give up on school. That's when Marino stepped in and worked his magic. Frank Marino said to me, don't lose faith. And he made me a deal one day, he says, uh, I'll trade you a leather jacket for a leather jacket and get you into college if you just do what I say. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. Well, he wanted me to do it for myself, and I did. And one day uh, he came to me and said, you're in college in Mankato, Minnesota. Okay, <laughs> he did it. The man saved my life. This kindness by Marino was not uncommon, and it certainly did not go unnoticed. The story of Jimmy is amazing to me. Here's a kid, we didn't know who Jimmy was, and he took him out of the hallways and put a football uniform on him, made him a player, and he wasn't the only one. He did that to a lot of guys. Another of Marino's strengths as a coach, and even more so as a person, was his ability to teach core values to his players, particularly how to be humble. He constantly reminded his players to keep their heads down and shuffle their feet. The humbleness with which we played all the time, that was another thing. Coach always emphasized that, like if we won a game, just be humble and then turn the page to the next game. Frank never wanted us to believe that we were better than everybody else. He just wanted us to be good, do the job, accept the win as you would a loss, but be humble about whatever you do. And it was, you know, head down, shuffle your feet. This was an important time for Morris Knowles, not just on the athletic fields, but for the legacy of the entire school. With a brand new building and a sister school that had been among the top schools in the area, it was pivotal for these coaches to do their part in building the foundation for Morris Knowles. Marino and his staff were up for the challenge. The coaches knew this was their ultimate moment to create the best they could create and set the stage for where this high school was going to go. That football team and that coaching staff and Frank Marino built the foundation for Morris Knowles High School, a foundation that is still there, still very strong, and the commitment of the people of Denville and parts of Rockaway Township is fantastic. I'm really taken by coming back to Morris Knowles to see what the school has become. We feel that we had a big part of that. And I think, as some of the other guys have alluded to, people like Coach Marino really got Marsh Knowles off to a great start. It wasn't just the coaches that contributed to this foundation, but the students and athletes of those first classes made their impact felt as well. We were building something here. We were just getting this place off the ground. And that, that was important. And I hope that the students here know that the foundation was laid by great people, great assistant football coaches, and great men and women. And with the success of those transitional years, and especially with the help of that championship team, the foundation was set for the future. Morris Knowles has since become a very successful high school, both academically and athletically. And 50 years later, the Golden Eagles have those 1965 coaches and student athletes to thank for establishing that greatness. Fifty years later, the helmet finally made its way home in stunning fashion. On a homecoming weekend in October of 2016, the plan, started by Suve and Francis and aided by Art Baggett, reached its finality. 
In a moving reunion and a warm reception from the administration, the helmet made its way back to Morris Knowles and was officially presented to the school. The festivities started with a pre-game gathering where the players, coaches, and families reunited, shared stories, viewed memorabilia, and watched a slideshow of the helmet's travels. Local media flocked to the scene to capture this amazing story, including reporters from the Star Ledger and NJ.com, showing just how great an event this reunion really was. After their gathering together and with the media, it was time for the team to make their way down to Caruso Stadium for the ceremony. Led by Suve with the helmet and Art Baggett, a long procession, including former and current players, all made their way to the turf. The members of the 65 team were introduced, and they took the field with the current Golden Eagle coaches and players. Suve brought the helmet through the line as everyone was able to touch it, bringing them all together in the finality of this legend. There you go, boys. Man. Go, guys. Go. Go. That's it. Thank you very much. And when Suve reached the end, he shared an emotional greeting with longtime football coach Bill Regan, who actually joined the staff in 1967, carrying on the legacy that Frank Marino began. Now, where's the coach Regan? Is this him? Coach, how are we doing? I've been wanting to meet you for a long time, sir. And this is for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. There you go, Appreciate sir. It. With you. honor. Thank you. Thank Respect you. it. Thank you. We love it. We will. We're going to give a good taste for it. Thank you, sir. Right. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good game, you guys. You guys, come okay. back in 50 years do the same thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Through it all, Suve, overwhelmed with emotion, never lost sight of what this reunion was all about. Frank Marino and what he did for those young men in that school in the mid-60s. It was because of him that we're here. Not because we, you know, are honored in all of that business. It's because of him, Frank Marino. Everybody in that school knew who he was at the time he was here. And everybody loved him. He loved everybody and he helped everybody and what Marino instilled in these men made them appreciate even more the magnitude of this moment. There'd be no helmet for us in Frank Marino, and, and that's the whole story. And that's really what this is all about. It means everything. Coming back here and getting to see the helmet being delivered here means so much. Being a member of the football team was such a big, important part of my life. Just seeing the guys after 50 years, I mean, how much better does that get? Marino would move on to have a Hall of Fame career at Muhlenberg College. He spent 43 years at the school, 11 years as a football coach, 8 as a volleyball coach, 11 as a lacrosse coach, and all of them as an ambassador of the school. His influence was so great that he was inducted into their Hall of Fame in 2002, and the field at Scotty Wood Stadium is named after him. Marino was a true coach, and he had a positive influence on many young men and women in his career. But on this day in October of 2016, it was his lasting influence on the young men of Morris Knowles High School that was on full display. He made a group of young men into a family, and he made that family into a championship team. Above all, he made those champions into men. And half a century later, these heroes of Morris Knowles used a helmet to capture the essence of Frank Marino and symbolize everything he did for them. And as such, it is only appropriate that this helmet had to emulate Marino's spirit and travel the country twice to reunite with its teammates, and then make it home for an epic celebration of Morris Knowles' storied past while connecting with those in the MK present 
and undoubtedly inspiring those of its future. Here we are on the campus of uh, Muhlenberg University. I'm with the uh, coach, uh, coach's wife, Carol Marino, and um, I'm very proud and honored to present to her today a Morris Knowles varsity letter. Uh, Jim Suve's pin, the letter from the uh, athletic department, and a lovely letter from uh, Coach Regan. So, Mrs. Marino, welcome to the varsity. Oh, You're always here. Thank you so much. Thank you, honey. Well, thank you. I always felt part of that. Voice. You were, you were the, you were the team mom. That's for sure. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're welcome. At the end of some of the discussion, this idea of shuffling your feet, <laughs> and Coach didn't leave that here. He took it with him when he went on to coach in Pennsylvania. And these guys from that area come back and say, I'm still shuffling my feet. <laughs> I've really been uh, touched by what Jimmy did by introducing or reintroducing the helmet to us uh, and getting us all together and thinking about uh, where, we've, where we came from. And, you know, this is, this is our place right here. Um, what Mars Knowles did for us, what we we did as a collective group and we went all over the place. This helmet went to, I don't know how many states, Hardy. Back and forth across the country but twice. <laughs> I think as a result of what we did here, what we had here, um, maybe and maybe with us a little piece of Coach Marino went to the far reaches of our country. I'm amazed at all this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the helmet is great, but Jimmy came up with a great idea. And 
and getting a hold of everybody. Uh, the majority of the guys were you could find easily. There's some are still living in caves, but <laughs> no email address and things like that. But we got a hold of most of them. There's a couple we missed out on, but just what's going on here today is a little overwhelming. All of these people were just so amazing to me. Like I said, when I started out with this team, I was like an outsider looking at all these guys, and they were they were two different people. And I was accepted by them, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm really proud of the fact that. I was part of such a great team. And that's all I have to say about that. That's These great. guys were terrific. Hey, and the coaches, like I said, Mr. Marino is part of that. Mr. Marino taught me how to shuffle my feet. And I did it. And that took a lot. <laughs> Good job, guys. Yeah. That was that was the all right. <laughs> Coach, thank you very much. You did a nice job. Thank you. Way to go. You did a nice job too. So these fellas. <laughs>